Hello, I see everybody here, and this is Radio Instigator, a signals intelligence tablet for $150. This uh, class will scare you because we are watching you. Who am I? I'm Josh Conway. I go by my nickname, Cranky Linux User. You've probably seen me, heard of me. I'm also an amateur radio operator. My license is KC9JEF. Uh, if you haven't heard of those things, you've probably heard other projects that I've had my hands in, some more nefarious, some less so. Uh, the big one I've done, uh, one recently was over at McVention in Bloomington, Indiana, and it was a facial recognition for your con. I know how everybody in here loves facial recognition. No, nope. This was a completely sealed, CPU only, no network, no API calls, no nothing. And it was a way we could actually count how many people showed up at the convention. So pretty good application. We did nothing bad with that data and the data's gone. So I also went and I've also done a uh, multi-site home hacker space automation because everybody loves the cloud, right? The cloud, everybody else's computer. So I actually designed my own, which used Tor, which turned all of your own devices into your own personal cloud. And another thing I've also had my hands in was the Thalamic Lab. So whoever remembers the Thalamic Myo, that bracelet that fits on your arm, that allows you to go through PowerPoint slides with your hand. Well, I, I kind of opened that up a little forcefully and said, okay, so you know, here's the actual raw data. You're not allowing people to use it. I figured out how to do it, and I released it to the whole world. So I've had my hands in that. But we get back to, what is this radio thing? Why are we here? Why do we care about this radio thing? Well, so... There's a few things that might be radios or might not be. Uh, so obviously there's an old FM AM radio set. There's a cell phone. There's a, a Tesla coil going on right there. There's an incandescent light, microwave, and a remote control. Any of these radios? Right? All of them? No, none of them? Thing is, is they all are. They all use electromagnetic radiation to do communication or something or they emit that we can receive and do things with. So, obviously, the transmission and reception of electromagnetic waves and radio frequency. Uh, traditionally, it's cared about sound messages, but now we have so much more digital communications. We care a lot more about digital comms and not analog comms. What is signals intelligence? This is the crux of the big issue here. And it's an intelligence gathering by interception of signals by whether communications between people. Uh, it's also called comment for communications intelligence or from electrical signals not directly using communication. For example, uh, I can tell if someone's home. I can tell if you're home. Oh, look, I saw your microwave transmit massive amounts of radiation. I can see that remotely from a quarter mile away and go, huh, they must be home. But still, why do we care? I mean, this is traditionally then the military apparatus. Why would we civilians care about this stuff? Because a lot of devices tend to use it, and we don't know about it. So we have wonderful right here. Sonicare asks for your location. It was asking you kindly. You know, why does a toothbrush need to know where your position with GPS satellites is? Pfft, heck if I know. Those washer and dryer set. Uh, that's just a washer and dryer, right? Well, they also tattle home to wherever they talk to in the cloud on AWS somewhere. And then, of course, we have the Nest. The Nest is a really good whipping child here because, you know, if you open it up, you get free wireless microphones that they didn't tell you about. And we don't even know what other sensors that they're running in there. And all these things, they all communicate via electromagnetic radiation, radio, and most of those signals we can't interrogate, we can't look at, we can't really do much of anything with. And, of course, you know, the big... The S stands for security, by the way. So... But security, what about these devices that we have? So obviously we have the traditional stacks. We have the identification, verification, authorization, auditing, and accountability. So we can at least do that with our own internal structures, you know, whether it be at home, whether it be at work. And we can actually identify and determine if the devices are actually under, they're complying with our security policy. But yet, when we get down to uh, Amazon Echo, uh, can we do any of these? Do we have the ability to do these? Do we even have root or do we have administrator access to these devices? No, no, and no. These things are black boxes that we're hoping that they do the right thing. And of course, you know, you combine it instead of the opposite of all the security features, you have unknown hardware, you know, you don't know, you know, free wireless microphones, free Zigbee radios that you didn't know were running in there and all sorts of weird things. They're unencrypted or worse, badly encrypted. We'll get to that. 
And then, of course, your AAA stack, the auditing authorization and authentication. Of course, you know, we ain't going to have any of that. And this is the project about the tablet I designed called the Radio Instigator. It'll take a moment to boot up. This is a platform I have built, and I have released the plans for anybody in this room and anybody in the world to build. It costs about $150 if you have your own 3D printer. I provide the full bill of materials and how to build it, all the plans, everything. How I built it. Here's some profile shots up close, and of course, after, after the, uh, the talk here, we can come over and talk and spit, hang out however long. And as you see here, single pull, single throw switch. We have quite a few SMA connectors. This is an RPSMA because Wi-Fi did things the backwards way. SMA, another transmit. Here's a crazy radio. This is a fun thing. I will later talk about that. Uh, this, by the way, crazy radio will scare you and terrify you, and you will remove certain hardware immediately, if you haven't already. And of course, we have Ethernet. Now, this is the internal. So if I open this thing up, this is actually what you would see on the back panel. Obviously, there's a big honking battery right there. Huh, GPS. I wonder what that's for. Hint, hint, recording the location of the signals you receive. We have Ethernet for easy transfer of files. Obviously, the back plane of this is a Raspberry Pi 3B+, nothing fancy there. But what's that SMA transmit going to? Wait, if you follow the line here, it actually goes to that hat pin header on the Raspberry Pi. What the heck is going on there? And then you have the crazy radio. If you trace that one down, it goes to a board right there. It's fairly easy to see. There's another Wi-Fi. I have a reason why I have a separate Wi-Fi chip for this thing, which we'll get to soon as well. That same switch. There's a receive SMA. This one goes to the uh, RTL-SDR. So everyone, I'm pretty sure, is familiar with an RTL-SDR. It's a cheap way of getting into, uh, uh, into uh, signal, uh, signals radio. Okay, and we have all four USB stack, uh, ports being used. The top is the RTL-SDR, bottom is Wi-Fi. And on the other port, we have the crazy radio. And then we have an HDMI touchscreen, and it actually takes power and uh, touch events over the USB. So really pretty awesome there. Printables. So there's about five major pieces of prints that you need in order to, to finish this part. You have the back plane. You have an exterior back. These, this will take you about 21 hours right there. So this is not a short print time, but if you have a printer, it's just sitting and spinning. There's a battery retaining bar because the last thing I wanted to have is that battery flop back and forth in the container. Uh, by the way, it happened once, never again. <laughs> uh, the front bezel, so that pretty blue bezel you see right there, that's the bezel piece. And then there's an LCD backplane that protects all of, because they have all of the uh, surface belt chips on the back of the LCD screen, so I printed the thing to guard against bumping up against those things. Even that antenna is custom on this. So this is a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, log parabolic antenna, and it's this nice piece right here. And I designed the prints for that as well. And of course that GPS holder, but that was a easy piece to do. Do you want to build one? Scan it. <laughs> and I'll have this up again at the end of the slide as well. I'm sorry? Yes, it's actually already published and live on gitlab.com slash cranky Linux user slash sigint tablet. So, if you can't afford this or you don't have access to a 3D printer and you want to be able to get started this week, here's some solutions that you can also do if you don't want to build this tablet. This is the notorious RTL SDR. This is the, the primary one that you'll find. This one's about a $20 unit. Uh, as you can see, it's obviously cheap. They're extremely easy to obtain. Just hit eBay or uh, you know, uh, uh, Amazon or whoever, and there you go. The frequency response is really pretty good, too, for the cheap. Uh, 24 megahertz to 1766 megahertz. There's a few of them that are modified, but they cut out different holes. Just get the standard one, and you'll be fine. 
the bandwidth. So when you actually think of the bandwidth, the bandwidth is how much sig signal can you take at any one time. And you get about two and almost two and a half megahertz of bandwidth. So you can sit at 100 megahertz and you can get you know, 102 megahertz, 101 megahertz and a 99 megahertz at one shot. That's what that means. Uh, of course, the bad side is it's also fairly cheap. Uh, there's a lot of features, like if you want to get 2.4 gigahertz, you're not doing it with this device. Uh, some of the other random builds are kind of dubious build quality. you got to watch out for that. Uh, and those antennas that are included, they're never good. <laughs> Next thing I look at is a Adon Pluto. Uh, this is a fairly hard-to-find device. It's only about $100 to $150, but it goes from 70 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. So if you want to do 2.4 inspection, you can do that. 5.8, you can do that. This thing is awesome. Uh, and a default, you get a 20 megahertz bandwidth window. So instead of that 2.4 tiny sliver, you get 20 megahertz, straight up. Uh, with some hacks, you can get 56 megahertz. Uh, but it tends to drop some frames there. Uh, and the really awesome thing is this is not just a receive hardware. This is actually, I, I think it's either ARM7 or ARM9 dual core Linux machine. So what you can do is you can compile things directly to this device and then run programs directly on there without going over USB 2. So this is a very unique feature about this where if you wanted to write some really interesting radar applications, you could certainly do that natively with this and then just put it on USB power and you're done. Uh, they can be hard to obtain. Uh, I tend to find it on Aero and it goes from $100 to $120, but what will happen is, is they'll just immediately go out of stock and be out of stock for days or weeks. Um, the downside for the transmit is it's only about 5 milliwatt transmit, so it's very, very quiet. Uh, however, inside of a walk-in refrigerator, it's more than sufficient for jamming GPS and controlling GPS. Like I said, in a controlled environment, don't do that out in public. It's bad. Um, then, of course, the other downside is also USB 2. There are a few other ones that are USB 3, but this is just 2. This is kind of the one that started everything out, the Hack RF. Uh, this is still a fairly expensive device. It is extremely well supported. And it's simplex, so that antenna right there, you can either transmit or you can receive, but you can't do both at the same time. So there's some limited applications there for bi-directional communication. However, one, it can go from one megahertz to six gigahertz, so you can get into the HF band very easily with this device. Uh, the best feature I found so far, which is almost a reason for me to go ahead and make that purchase, is that sweep mode. It can do a eight gigahertz a second continuously, so it sweeps across the whole spectrum showing you everything what's going on. Uh, so what you could do is you could create a, uh, uh, a flow of where you have one of these with, say, uh, four Plutos. And then you find all the features with this thing continuously sweeping, and then you have the four Plutos doing the individual work on specific spectrums. So there's some really cool work there and further applications. And this is a very new piece of software or hardware, and this is called the Cabarrus SDR. Think of this as a quad damage RTL SDR. And what this is, this is a fully coherent radio receiver, so it can't transmit, but I can have this set up here, and I can say, oh yes, there is a signal of 200 megahertz that direction, and actually tells you how far away that signal is, not just that there is a signal. So this can be very good for fox hunting, this can be good for RFI detection, uh, and it's also very good to figure out what exactly are those things doing? Why? Oh, that's a tower up there. Oh, that's this thing. We also have to talk about antennas, because when you buy our SDRs, the antennas are kind of bad. <laughs> so, omnidirectional, we've almost always seen these one way or another. Uh, so we have the omnidirectionals, and they're good for just general, I always want to get it up and running, I want to see what's out there. Uh, now, the next to this is actually a Smith chart. And this allows you to see the polarization of how this thing looks in the air. Now, so what this looks like, you have to apply this as a 3D coordinate. So if, if this thing is sitting up, the horizontal polarization is how far it goes around you. And the vertical is what the vertical emanation looks like. So you combine them together, and it looks like a donut, if you will. It's a good donut with two lobes on the bottom and top. And that shows you where the signals are best being received from with this device. Uh, and usually what they'll provide is they'll provide a, if, if you have antennas that are good for multiple frequencies, they'll show you multiple points on the frequencies of these charts. So you get an idea, is, is this attenuated correctly for you? Yagi's, uh, we've traditionally seen these as TV antennas. So obviously they look like this. 
Uh, and when they look in the air, they actually have a very, very strong lobe. So they pick up a tiny bit close to you, but they go a really long distance. So they're just trading that omnidirectionality for a very, very high pointedness. And of course, what it kind of looks like when you have it applied, it looks just like this map. So it shows that so that's where your TV antenna would be pointing out the signal. And then there it goes. You see I have a little bit of lobes around there, but the primary long one. Then we get into some more exotic antennas. Uh, this is a log parabolic antenna. And this is a really neat one. Uh, this is actually the same one I'm running on my tablet as well as this weird trapezoidal one. And what this is uh, really nice for is it will handle a very wide spectrum of frequencies. And it will hop internally from the appropriate array of length of the array to the actual antenna. Uh, so this antenna, for example, the one I'm running on here, goes from 1.35 gigahertz to 9.5 gigahertz. And that's kind of unheard of for a lot of antennas of where they're specifically like for GSM or they're for whatever other protocols. Uh, so they're extremely wideband. And this is kind of what they look like when you look at the graph. They're highly directional, uh, both vertical and horizontal. Uh, this could be good so like for example if you're fox hunting or you're finding interesting details in certain areas you can say oh that came from this sliver of area over here it's somewhere around there uh, and along with that they kind of look similar to Yagi the previous one and here's an example of the electrical connectivity compared these two so the Yagi has two elements right there the purple one and the green one and then it has a whole bunch of non-connected director elements Whereas the log periodic is this weird crisscross back and forth across the whole array. Uh, that's what gives it its unique ability to handle multiple frequencies at the same time, or at the same time. Then we get into this really strange one, a Vivaldi antenna. That's an antenna, and it's a weird slice. And what this radiation pattern looks like is it's also tremendously directional. And you end up with frequency responses of like 1 gigahertz to 21 gigahertz. Because it goes from the tiniest slice right here as the smallest of the highest frequency to the frequency of this length. So you can make it bigger or small as you want, and it will attenuate across that whole set of frequencies. Uh, so it's a very, very interesting style. It's fairly new still. Um, then we have one other type of antenna we have to talk on as well called the helical antennas. Uh, usually if you find uh, rubber duckies on Motorola handsets or whatever, or even my potato, my bow thing, this is actually a helical antenna as well. Uh, this is a really neat style. Um, and we have to, get to talk a little bit about polarization in this, because uh, normally if you have a horizontal polarization, if you think about like uh, sunglasses, where if you look at an LCD screen, if you turn your head or turn the glasses, uh, these screen will fade in and out of black and normal. And that's because the lights polarize in that certain way. Uh, and if you try, if you're using a vertical polarized antenna and you try to read horizontally polarized signals, you take a 20 dB drop. You pretty much just can't hear it. Now, why do we care about helicals? Because a helical, if you try to listen to vertical or horizontal, you only take a 3 dB drop, which means it's only about half the signal is lost, but it allows you both access to a horizontal and vertical. Now, how are these polarized? Well, they're polarized by clockwiseness. So you have a clockwise and a counterclockwise. Uh, clockwise, whoever, who here has tried talking to the International Space Station? Okay. So you, clockwise, isn't it? Okay. So that's how you had to talk to all of the public and civilian facing stuff. Do you know who uses counterclockwise? I'll give you a hint. The military. Military uses counterclockwise, which is why you almost never see it. And if you want to, you have to build it yourself. So, that's why we care about the clockwiseness. If you want to cover regular, old, uh, horizontal, or vertical, go with the clockwise. You can talk to a ton of stuff. Then when we get to the software itself. So, you know, obviously this platform gets you only a certain point until we actually have the software stack to work with this. So, obviously I started with, I wanted to start with something that was the most supported and best respected. So I went ahead with Raspbian on this device. And then along with that, for controlling the radios, GNU Radio is the solution here. I mean, everyone is using it. I have friends and colleagues who are in interesting areas who also use GNU Radio. Everybody is hacking with it. It is the best tool for the job. Now, remember that earlier picture where I showed that SMA transmit, how it was going directly to a header with nothing else going on there? 
Well, this library is called RPITX. This is really a, the basis of what makes, makes this platform a full transmit platform. And what this is, it turns out that on a Raspberry Pi, GPIO pin number four is actually the uh, GPU uh, clock pin as well. And if you do terrible things to that clock pin, you can actually transmit from 100 kilohertz to 1.5 gigahertz. So you have an extremely wide range of frequencies you can transmit from. Now, the bad side about this is it's noisy. Use a bandpass filter if you do this. Um, because it will cause a lot of very spurious harmonics all throughout the spectrum when you try to transmit. Uh, but this does work. And who here, by the way, has a, has a Raspberry Pi? Any of them? Okay, everybody can transmit. So I was actually asked before, you know, why would you give somebody the ability to transmit on anything? Well, I didn't. You already have it. <laughs> then we also have other features in this software as well that we can do a whole bunch of just transmit only things. We can even transmit pager messages, by the way, with this device. And yes, it works. It's kind of amazing. We can also, it integrates with the RTL-SDR, so we can do some really fun things too with listening and talking back and all sorts of fun things. I won't get into that. Now, who here has not used, but who has seen GNU Radio Companion? Okay. So GNU Radio Companion, it looks pretty terrifying. I mean, you have a fairly empty window right here. You have a whole bunch of modules. It's like, what the heck do they do? What's going on here? And it actually turns out this would be a whole talk by itself, hours long talk, just to talk about even a few of the features for this. But one of the really cool things about it is this is just a pretty GUI for Python programming. Who knows Python? Okay, compared that to the first list of two people raising their hands knowing GNU Radio. Everyone who knows Python, it just generates a Python file down here in your home directory. And there you go. If you wanted to play around with it and figure out what it's actually doing under the covers, there it is. Just read some Python and you're good to go. The next tool I use a lot is something called GQRX. Uh, this is a really good tool for figuring out, oh, there's something interesting there. There's really neat waveforms. And as you can see, you can just scan across of the whole any of the frequency you have access to and go, huh, what's going on at, say, 525.25 megahertz? Oh, that was session one. And of course, there are a few downsides of this tool. It does only support a few protocols, unlike something like GNU Radio, where you can build any protocol you want. Uh, this only has support just for a few things. Uh, it can chew through resources depending on how big and how big your waterfall plot is and what you're doing. And sometimes I find it to be a little crashy when you try to do recordings. From like I, if you try to record the IQ data, it'll go like, yeah, I'm recording, I'm recording. Okay, core dump. <laughs> One of the tools here that I really appreciate is something called Universal Radio Hacker. I found this tool actually a while back. And what this tool, this will also integrate with your software-defined radio stack. Uh, and what this allows is this allows receiving and communicating with interesting hardware. Uh, so let's say you know that there's a digital communication going on. Uh, and then, for example, what I was, what I did was I found somebody with some Motorola FSM, or was it, I forget, the family radios, FRS radios. And there was an emergency mode button that would cause every radio on the network to go off. Huh, hey, 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 can you trigger that for me? And I went to Universal Radio Hacker and I recorded that data as an IQ data. So it's actual the raw underlying radio waves. And they're like, okay, cool. And I did it and then they, they turned off the alarms. And then I played back using Universal Radio Hacker and caused all their, all their uh, handsets to also go off yet again. And they couldn't stop it this time. They actually had to turn off the devices because something this did actually triggered them to fire off. But what's really cool about this tool is it allows you to record playback. And not only that, but also then assess the underlying data structures. Um, and there's a lot of things going back behind that. But we can, we can identify if it's an, a digital signal. When we can classify that data, pick the data out, figure out how it's working. We can fuzz the device using this thing. So you don't know what that field does? Eh, touch it. See what happens. Just hope it doesn't break the firmware. This is an exceptional set of videos, by the way, by Johannes Pohl. This guy is the creator of Universal Radio Hacker, so I would assume he's pretty proficient in the software that he wrote. And there's a whole bunch of YouTube videos. I'll link to the first one there. So 
So the, the basics behind Universal Radio Hacker and how it works is actually this, of where you have a modulation, so you have a signal, something yummy that you're interested in working with, doing, talking with, and things. And then you have two types, so you have an analog and a digital modulation. And then we have, from there, we actually have the different, obviously we've heard a few of these already, so we've heard of amplitude modulation, AM radio, that, that is, FM radio. PM is weird. Phase modulation is kind of like FM, but the wave directionality changes instead of the wave changing. And we'll, we'll show a graph exactly what's going on there. It's weird. And it was traditionally extremely hard to do that in hardware. Man, now it's easy. Then we have the digital side of stuff. And this is the stuff that we're going to care a lot about a lot more. We have amplitude shift keying. We have frequency shift keying and phase shift keying. And to give examples, pretty pictures are always great. So this is an example. So this is a digital side of things. So you have the signal basic 1010 coming in. You have your carrier frequency. This is the actual destination frequency. So if you're on, say, um, 434 megahertz. By the way, that's the same frequency that your TPMs in your cars use for your tires. So I didn't know if you do that. It's actually really easy to track people people's vehicles by tracking the serial numbers in their tires. Simple. But this would be like 434 megahertz. This would be your serial number. And of course, these are the different possible ways of encoding that data. So analog shift keying, this is what it looks like. It looks kind of like the on, off, on, off, on, off. Uh, the frequency shift keying is the wave compresses and expands. And then phase shift keying, this is where it gets weird on this side, of where the wave shifts by 180 degrees uh, to indicate a difference of data. Of course, we also have the analog side. We can't just forget the analog side. So this, you have an analog. Instead of having a digital data, you have an analog signal. You have the same carrier, whatever frequency. And then, of course, this is what an AM wave looks like over the air. Your FM looks like that. Now, phase modulation is weird. You can't tell if it's phase or, a or FM but just by looking at it. Because on the analog side, the wave itself shifts by 90 degrees. So this is a really hard one to find, which is why this has been traditionally hard to work with. Because how do you tell a radio, I'm shifted by 90, 180 degrees? But this is the old school stuff. It gets crazy from here. What the hell is this? This is called 4QAM, quadrature amplitude modulation. This is where you combine phase and amplitude together at right angles. And then when you combine them at right angles, instead of creating a signal that's low or high or an analog, you end up with one of four regions like this. So now the signals can go into this region, this region, that, or that. So that now every symbol, every thing, every parcel of data, we call that a symbol in this language, by the way, every symbol can represent now four bits instead of just one. Now this matters because symbols the, don't think of a symbol as it's always four bits or it's always a certain thing because we're going to really throw some crazy stuff in even on top of this. But your data ends up looking a scatter plot like this. So this is, this is just 4 QAM. How about 16 QAM? This is the standard stuff. So who, who here has watched over the air TV in the last five years? Okay. Your TV is using this. So instead of having just four regions, now you have this many, you have 16 regions. And how the data is calculated is you see, you can see the amplitude percentage there, the phase percentage, and out of amplitude and phase, you get the actual data point that it represents. So in this case, every point of data, every symbol, is now 16 bits. Oh yeah, it, this goes up to 4096. So this gets crazy. Uh, there's some power lines up that I saw fairly recently that was they were purporting to sending 10 gigabit over a uh, outlet that was using 4096 QAM. This stuff is crazy. This stuff is hard to re review. Uh, if you, especially if you have a software-defined radio, you need to, some fairly expensive hardware to see this. But be aware, this exists. And if you think that you saw one of those uh, six frequencies before, but it doesn't quite match. Run it through a QAM filter and see what you're really getting. We get into some other software outside of the Universal Radio Hacker. This is a really awesome piece of software that fits within the signals intelligence area. This is called Sandra. And this needs a microphone, or this needs a speaker, so you can pair those with a Bluetooth speaker. And what it does is it sends out continuous chirps 
that it knows what it's sending out. But then it does is it listens for the radio waveform that matches the audio. So you can say sweep it from 100 megahertz to a gigahertz. And then this thing reports back all the frequencies that match that interesting response. Allows you to see, so if somebody did plant a spy bug anywhere around your area, you can actually find it at this thing. Now this thing, unfortunately, can't find digital encoded messages because then it's ha you have to find the digital frequency and th that's a little different. This is more of your analog. So you're, you're expecting to see like AM or FM or PM detection with this tool. And then we have, well, Tempest. Wait, that, well, that was that, that term back from the 1970s that really, that was scary that came out of the NSA and a few other things. And what this is actually is even a scarier idea of every electronic thing that has power going through a wire is also a transmitter. And this idea terrifies secure agencies. Because how do you stop this? Well, you can shield, you can run everything in metal boxes, that's certainly possible. Uh, but how do you stop the laptop from emanating? How do you stop your desktop from emanating? How do you stop your monitor from emanating? And it turns out with this, you can even pick up other people's LCD screens with this device. So I, I do notice that there's nobody running a laptop in here. Awesome. <laughs> but this device, with this software, you can actually start looking for and getting black and white images of remote people's monitors. And I'm not meaning connect via Wi-Fi, some large Wi-Fi. I'm talking about natively as in no connectivity other than I am showing a picture on the screen. This stuff is creepy, and there is defenses against this. It's called don't use technology. Uh, I know a colleague on IRC that builds hardware that does this. Uh, for a simple desktop, it's around $10,000 for a Tempest-tested and Tempest-approved desktop. That's not including the monitor. That's not including a keyboard. That's not including anything. I'm not going to invoke the wrath of the gods by attempting a real demo. First, I'm going to do is I have my amateur radio here. I'm going to turn it on. Frequency mode. Turn it to 434 megahertz. Four, three, four, zero, zero, zero. Okay. Let me go ahead and get my software up here. Okay. KC9JEF testing. Playback. Ah. It looks like I invoked the wrath. <laughs> Let's try once again here. Nope, it is not going to cooperate with me today. <laughs> it looks like I angered them. So, how do you solve this? What can you do about this? I mean, I'm showing you a scary tool that can attack signals, it can interrogate, it can read them, it can do things to them. Well, the simplest answer here is to actually remove the problem. Take it out. Remove it. That's also probably the most unpalatable answer here because it says to get rid of the gear that offends you. And, well, after you spend multiple hundreds of dollars on gear, you don't want to do that. Well, you can wait for an update and hope that an update actually works. And yeah, you'll be waiting for a long time for some of these companies because some of the hardware is actually by dead companies. They don't exist any longer. Do you know what you have? Is it secure? Can you prove it? Have you even pen tested it? Well, you can wait. Or you can pretend it isn't a problem at all. How's that work for people so far? How'd that work for Target? Not terribly well.
But that is certainly an option here. So where do we go from here? Obviously, we have the platform. Here is a QR code, by the way, goes to the whole GitHub repo or GitLab repo. So if you go ahead and hit this QR code again, it's going to be up. So where do we go? Well, we can go actually with briefcase size, with more transceivers. We can hit a lot more hard, we, you know, a lot more hardware, a lot more uh, interesting things going on, better batteries, longer running time. Uh, and I saw that the, there was a kit that people have made for pen testing of where you put a briefcase and you have Raspberry Pis and you have Wi-Fi hardware, Bluetooth hardware, and you pack it all together and with, with big batteries and you throw it into a premises to try to hack them. Well, this allows you also, if, if the briefcase would actually allow you to build one that would be able to test their whole radio environment and not just Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, I also want to redesign this with using a lot more batteries, ideally using six, 18650s, which are those really big lithium ion cells. Um, they're on laptops. If you ever crack open dead, bat dead laptop batteries, you'll find tons of them. Um, I also want to like, write network code to combine many of these things. I want to build just more than one of these. I want to build six of these and then have them so they talk with each other and share the data to create a coherent radio network across an area. Uh, I want to do a continuous scanning mode. So I talked previously about the HackRF that can do a continuous sweep. I want to be able to automate and understand what's already happening in the radio spectrum and go, oh, why did that thing show up over there? Why is that over there? Did we approve that device? And I want to be able to be ahead of the game. Think of this like I want to go for something like a snort for radio. And then I also would like to create a scanning and submission network for classifying signals. There's quite a few people doing work with SDRs already. But how many times have you looked at the SDRs, you saw something around the 320 megahertz spectrum, and went, what the hell is that? How many people have seen just something, but they had no clue even what it is or what? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I would like to be able at least to ask, you know, how, have, you, have you all seen this? Oh, wait, one person already did, and they already know what it is. It's a military beacon. Okay, cool. We can move on from there. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the best thing here is more power. I want more bandwidth. I want more spectrum. I want more stuff to be able to view. I want to have more radios to do at the same time. And that is my talk. And I would be glad to take any questions anyone may have. Yes? I'm sorry? Oh, I could make it spin, but right now it's not quite. It's a fixed antenna. I'm sorry? Um, not really. Uh, well, for, ra for radar, if, if you actually had a directional, uh, this, this antenna right here, this lug parabolic, is directional this direction. So doing this allows me to control uh, the directionality of that antenna. And I didn't get to that, but this antenna is actually really sad and sick. What this is for is this is that crazy radio thing. And the crazy radio, who here, oh, this is a great one, who here uses or knows someone who uses a wireless keyboard or mouse? This device in, pro, in about half mile proximity can take control, can read, can jam you out of it. Yes, it is. It's actually two libraries. It's MouseJack, which is the easy tool, and then it's also GR-Nordic, which is the GNU radio component that allows you to write a full, ba uh, a full front end for that radio. Uh, and of course, you can do some very bad things with it. I won't run it here because I can't control which device it goes to easily. Uh, but one attack that I have uh, does a combo that does win Windows key plus R, types in notepad.exe, presses enter, and then types in your machine has been hacked. This is not something I want to run in production here in a facility I can't control. Uh, but if you look up MouseJack or GR-Nordic, uh, this, by the way, the actual hardware is extremely expensive at a whole $8. So if you are running or know someone who runs wireless keyboards and mice, remove them. So, a little bit of example about that. Now, with the spinning of antennas, what that is really good for is, say, uh, you have a directionality of where if it was a direction like this, and it was facing out like this, then if you spun it, then it would go this way, and it would be a sweeping horizontal plane. Whereas the way I chose to do this, I just had to do this. 
Any other questions? Yes. Well, uh, quite a few things. Uh, one thing I was able to do and I found was I wasn't sure if this would actually have enough bandwidth, uh, transmit bandwidth to actually not just jam GPS. Jamming GPS is easy. I mean, you just fill, fill the frequency full of static and if it's close enough, you win. Uh, that's not quite exactly true, but it's sufficiently it's true if you're close enough. But I wanted to see, could I actually do a GPS takeover? So somebody actually wrote a module already. If you look up uh, Pluto-GPS-SIM, -dash -dash uh, this works natively for the Adolm Pluto that I discussed earlier. And what, you, what this allows is this allow, you feed it in the constellation data of where the satellites are, and then it generates all the data back out, faking all 12 satellites, and I can control any device in the region I want it to be at this location. And I actually determined that this barely has enough transmit bandwidth to actually cause that to occur on a cell phone. Uh, I wasn't going to go there because that's when it gets into illegal things. I'm trying to avoid illegal here. <laughs> but yes, if, if you have no scruples, absolutely. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much.